Good morning and good afternoon to all of you for joining our live webinar today, Validation and Optimization of Automated Patch Clamp Voltage-Gated Calcium Channel Assays. My name is Jason Villagomez, Marketing Manager at Nanion Technologies, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Joining us today as speakers will be Dr. Andras Horvath and Dr. Mark Rogers. Andras currently serves as an application scientist at Nanion Technologies. During the course of his PhD, he has focused on studying potassium channels in mammaline heart and stem cell derived carinocytes. He holds a PhD from the University of Medical Center Hamburg and University Zagrad. He has presented his work at conferences throughout the world and has featured in renowned high impact journals. Mark serves as the chief scientific officer at Matrion Biosciences. He has extensive experience managing screening projects and outsourcing preclinical drug discovery work and leads the company's efforts with respect to international pharma collaborations and UK and European grant subjects projects, specializing in NAV, CAV, and TRIP channels for pain, voltage gated potassium channels in autoimmune immune diseases and cardiac safety panels. Additional information can be found on matreonbiosciences.com. Upon completion of the presentation, we will hold a live Q&A session and as such welcome you to ask our presenters questions at any time throughout the presentation. You can log a question via the ask a question function found on the right hand side of your screen. Today's presentation will be made available on demand immediately upon completion of the event. And as such, I will now hand over the presentation to Andras for the start of the presentation. Thank you, Jason, for the introduction. And on behalf of the Nanion team, I would also like to greet everyone <coughs> uh, for joining our webinar today. And I would like to give an introduction to automated patch clamp in its most flexible form, the patch liner. In my talk, first of all, I will talk about how automated patch clamp works. And then I will show some example data recorded from voltage gated channels and also show an example uh, of internal solution exchange. Then I will move on to show some ligand gated ion channel data and heat activated channel data. After that, I will sum up, sum up my talk. <clears throat> so first of, first of all, how automated patch clamp works. As you can see on the title, a chip replaces the pi pipette. And what does it mean? So on the top, you can see a manu manual rig where we use a glass pipette with a top tip diameter of one micrometer. And with this pipette, we approach the cell, so, uh, form a strong connection between the cell membrane and the tip wall, which is also called gigasphere connection. And after that, we rupture the membrane, and then we are able to measure transmembrane ionic currents. For this, a skilled personnel, <coughs> uh, a lot of training, a pipette puller, a Faraday cage, microscope, and an anti-vibration table is needed. So it's a pretty compli complicated procedure. In contrast to that, uh, as you can see on the lower pa part, a planar patch clamp. Uh, in case of planar patch, planar patch clamp, uh, the tip, the glass tip was, is replaced by a glass surface with a one micrometer hole in the middle. And the droplet of cells we place to, near to this hole. And after applying suction, a cell attracts the hole and we are able to form the strong connection, called, uh, also called gigasphere, and rupture the membrane and measure. Contrast to the manual rig, we do not need pipette puller, Faraday cage, or anti-vibration, or even a microscope to perform the experiments, and it's much, much more easier to handle. And one of the main advantages is that multiple sense can be recorded in parallel to increase the throughput. In this slide, you can see how a cell attracts uh, to the hole. And as you can see the video, when a suction is used from underneath uh, uh, to attract the cell, once one cell will stuck in the hole, and on the right side on the schematic figure, you can see after, after it happened, uh, we use um, <coughs> um, pressure stats to rupture the membrane, and we 
we, we can ready to, we are ready to measure. At our company, uh, we offer different uh, machines with different throughput. The smallest uh, of our machines is the Porta Patch, which is a semi-automated machine with a single recording channel. It allows you to measure up to 50 data points per day. The se our second machine, the medium throughput machine, is the pe uh, patch liner. It's a fully automated machine. It can, uh, it can be used in four channel or eight channel modes, and it, can, uh, allow it allows you to record up to 600 data points per day. And last, our biggest machine, the synchro patch, uh, could be used in 384 and 768 more uh, recording channel mode, depending on if there is one or two modules installed. And it allows you to record up to 20,000 or even 40,000 data points per day. So now I would like to introduce uh, the patch liner in more detail. So why to choose patch liner? It is a high uh, recital, fully automated patch clamp platform. It has uh, unlimited experimental freedom and efficient screening. It provides high data quality and medium throughput with minimized shelf consumption. So you can perform gigasphere measurements and full concentration response curves on individual cells. It has full automation in various recording modes, so you can measure in voltage clamp and current clamp mode, and it has also an automated dynamic clamp interface. Physiological temperature control is also possible, so you can test compounds and compare responses at different temperatures. You can control the environment of your cells and solutions at all times with a cool cell hotel, which increases the viability of cells and solutions containing, for example, ATP. It provides high quality, it comes with high quality customizable consumables made in house. You can have single or multi hole chips and various resistances. It has an efficient and easy to use software package and it is com compatible with primary cells and stem cells as well. Now I would like to introduce the, <coughs> the chip of the patch liner. It is called also MTC16 chip because it has 16 valves. It's made in, uh, the chip production is made in house. So we have complete control over our production steps, rigorous quality control standards, minimal batch to batch variation, single hole or multi hole chips and high cost efficiency. On the right side, you can see in case of HEC 293 cells, the majority of the experiments are reaching a gigasphere resistance, uh, indicating uh, a good uh, experimental environment. And as we got uh, from one of our customers, in case of primary cells, uh, they were able to have excellent success, success rates in case of primary cells. The patch liner is compatible with a wide variety of cell types and ion channels targets. Uh, the machine is already uh, was successfully used in a case of a lot of voltage gated channels, light gated channels, other type of channels and bilayers. You can use many different cell types, uh, cell lines such as HEC 293, CHO or Jurcap cells, for example, a large variety of primary cells, for example, smooth muscle cells, lysosomes and so on. And they are compatible with stem cells such as ITSC derived cardiomyocytes. So now we'd like to show how an experiment is carried out on the patch liner. Here you can see a cross section of one well of the MTC16 chip. As the first step outside of the measure head, uh, the, uh, the pipette fills up the internal solution chamber. And after that, the chip wagon moves the chip into the measure head and then the pipette fills up uh, the external solution chamber with external solution. And to avoid solution overflow, <coughs> the, there is a continuous waste removal also installed. After that, the pipette uh, will add the cells. 
and during that um, uh, suction is already applied so it allows that one yes one cell, a cell will attract to the hole and uh, starts uh, starts to perform the giga circum uh, formation and then we apply a wash step to remove uh, the 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 remaining cells you can see now and after that we rupture the cell membrane so we have access to the cell and we we can start recording and in this example uh, sodium channel is measured and as you can see after addition of a blocker an immediate blocking effect uh, uh, is happening and <clears throat> because of the continuous waste removal you, you can have you can try as much compounds as possible now I would like to show some example data first of all voltage gated channels and internal so solution exchange so in this slide um, <coughs> CHO cells expressing uh, not 1.7 so a sodium channel um, was investigated and on the left side of the screen you can see full concentration response curves made on four uh, known blockers of the sodium channel and, the, the, and the, the current was recorded the concentration response curves were made at um, a half maximum activation of the current and at minus 120 millivolts and as you can see there was a shift in potency of all four blockers um, suggesting the state dependency uh, of the blockers on the right side you can see original recordings um, where four different concentrations of tetracaine was, ex uh, was applied on the cells and on the bottom you can see a time course experiment here you can see nicely how fast and precise uh, the the effect uh, the measurement was and also the, uh, it was very stable here you can see an activation of and inactivation of a calcium channel um, uh, which was except, uh, uh, expressed in hec 293 cells and as you can see we were able to calculate the half maximum inactivation of the current at minus uh, 33 millivolts and the half maximum inactivation at minus 60 millivolts and on the right side you can see an original IV recording of the CAF 3.2 now I would like to show an example for internal solution exchange in this case we measured <coughs> slow conductance calcium activated potassium uh, current also called SK4 and during internal ex uh, solution exchange the recording is stopped and the, measure, uh, the, the chip will be removed from the measure head the pipette will exchange the internal solution and then the chip bagger moves back the chip to the measure head and the recording will continue and as you can see on the original recording and also on the time course one micro addition of one micromole phi calcium uh, activated uh, the SK4 current while 5 millimolar barium effectively inhibited it on the right side you can see that the blocker TRAM34 blocked the current in a concentration dependent manner now I would like to show some ligand gated ion channel and heat activation experiments for ligand gated activation uh, we used P2X receptor pharmacology on the left side you can see P2X3 homomeres expressed in CHO cells and as you can see pre-incubation of the cells with the blockers 30, uh, A317491 in various concentration in the inhibited the alpha beta ATP activated current in a concentration dependent manner the same holds true for the PTX23 heteromeres so <clears throat> pre-incubation of the cells with various concentration of suramin inhibited the 30 micromole ATP activated current also in concentration dependent manner the IC50 values were 
uh, approximately 86 nanomole and 28 nanomole, uh, micromole, and those values were in good agreement uh, with the literature. Now I would like to show some heat activate uh, temperature controlled experiments. Those experiments were carried out, carried out on a transient receptor potential ventilator channel type 1. First of all, uh, how it was carried out, so how we apply a heated solution. On the first uh, picture, you can see that the solution is heated in the pipette until it reaches the desired temperature. And then if we move to the second picture, as you can see, the heated solution flows over the cell and the strip free channels are activated. This is what you can see on that uh, right bottom on the small inset, how the uh, current activates. And as the solution cools back from, temp uh, from uh, to room temperature, the strip free channels return to baseline. Here you can, the trip one uh, channel can be activated either with uh, capsaicin or with heat. On the first, you can see that the capsaicin uh, activates the current in a concentration dependent manner. Here you can, uh, on the second uh, picture, you can see that increasing temperature activates more and more current. And as, as, and as you can see on the last slide, the block of capsaicin inhibits both the capsaicin activated and the heat activated current in a concentration dependent manner. To sum up uh, our, our results with the patch liner, which we believe is the most flexible automated patch frame system, you can perform accurate biophysical characterization of voltage gated channels. You can do recordings at individual half maximum uh, half um, maximum activation. You can perform internal solution exchange, fast act activation of ligand gated channels, heat activation of strip channels. Please also do not forget that instead of all automated patch clamp devices, we have solid supported membrane um, based electrophysiology device devices, the surfer family, which are great tools to measure exchangers and transporters, and we have great bilayer uh, devices, the Orbit Mini and the Orbit 16, and we have the cardioic side and the, uh, and the flex side, which, can, uh, which are uh, effectively could be used in contractility field potential and impedance recordings. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to, uh, uh, would, uh, I would like to ask Mark Rogers to continue from here. So thank you again for your attention. Right, thank you, Andras, uh, for an introduction to the technical aspects of uh, the patch liner. Uh, I'm now gonna spend the next 25 to 30 minutes talking about how we use this platform in the real world iron channel drug discovery project. So first of all, I'd like to thank Nanyan for helping us set up this uh, webinar. This is my first webinar. Uh, oh, there's just nothing more I should say about that. I just hope it goes well and people enjoy it. Uh, but I also want to thank um, Grunenthal because this is a project um, that we did an eight-year an eight collaboration with Grunenthal on our calcium channels for pain. And as a as a CRO, Metron doesn't often get an opportunity to talk about the work that we do with with a number of these bigger projects. Uh, so I do want to thank the people at Grunenthal for giving us permission to uh, present this data. Um, so, without further ado, for those of you who don't already know Metreon, we are a preclinical contract research organization uh, based in Cambridge, UK. Our speciality is ion channel drug discovery and safety pharmacology testing. We uh, use electrophysiology platforms throughout, so manual patch, automated patch, multi-electrode array, and also the impedance um, platform that Andras just mentioned. So in my presentation today, I'm going to highlight some of the skills that we can bring to bear on the ion channel drug discovery at Metreon, specifically cell line optimization and assay development, uh, the use of automated patch clamp in uh, drug discovery uh, screening services as a CRO, and also uh, expertise in automated patch clamp platforms. So we have a number of different automated patch platforms available at Metreon, uh, but in the case of the calcium channel assay, the patch liner was the preferred platform. 
And I'll give you some examples of uh, why we found that to be the case. Uh, but we also do a lot of work with native neurons and also uh, human iPS C-derived cells. We have a number of strategic partners for iPS cells. And we also carry out an, uh, cell line development, HCS, and integrated drug discovery work with uh, the partners that are shown at the bottom of this slide, uh, all in um, the UK and in Europe. So my talk will just start with an overview of the need for new non-opioid analgesics and the uh, validation for calcium channels as a novel pain target. I'll then go into some detail in the assays that we set up on the patch liner to prosecute CAV 2.2 as a pain target, uh, looking at the potency assays, gene family selectivity, and also species selectivity assays. And we'll finish off with an example of some of the small molecules that we developed through the screening cascade to show that they are in fact active in preclinical pain models and just finish up conclusions and acknowledgements. So, the need for non-opioid analgesics, I think, is a, a pretty well-known story nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of patients, 25% of patients, go to see the doctor because they have chronic pain, but only half of those patients who receive current medicine actually get um, decent pain relief from those treatments. So there's a lot of interest in, in having novel and different and better pain treatments. Uh, the main issue, of course, with opioids, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, there are significant side effects for the patients, uh, as well as uh, development of tolerance. And at a societal level, the abuse potential of opioids is, uh, is a growing threat. And the, the statistic that I always give with this talk is every day in the US, over 100 people die of um, opioid um, overdosing. It's 100 people every day. So there is a huge need to move away from opioids and find better and safer and more effective uh, analgesic treatments. So there's a couple of drugs that are already on the market, but they're not perfect. Uh, there are the gabapentinoids, uh, gabapentin or neurontin, and the uh, fast follower pregabalin or Lyrica. So they're not very selective. They also have a number of side effects. And in fact, pregabalin also has some abuse potential because of the CNS side effects. Uh, and there's also a lot of off-label use of uh, anticonvulsants and antidepressants that uh, officially work through GABA-A and sodium channels, for example. So there's not a great uh, collection of analgesic drugs at the moment, and there's been a tremendous amount of effort over the last two decades to develop um, new ligands against new targets. Uh, there's a lot of work, obviously, in uh, GPCR families. So we're looking at cannabinoids, uh, GABA-B modulators, neurokinins, angiotensin II, the nociceptin or fanin receptor, metabolic glutamate receptors, um, and as well, there's also another separate class of the tyrosine kinase, uh, neurotrophin receptors, so a couple of programs that have developed antagonists against uh, NGF. They've, these have all had some success preclinically. They've also gone into the clinic, but they've had a few issues in the clinic. But they're still all being actively developed, and there may be new novel pain ligands coming from this work. There's a separate category of uh, ion channel ligands. So we're looking at the ligand-gated receptors here, so uh, the inhibitory GABA-A, um, some PAMs and agonists for that target class. We've also uh, antagonists such as ketamine for the NMDA receptors. And there's a number of preclinical and clinical programs for the P2X and the TRIPX channels, so the TRIP-V1 and TRIP-A1. Uh, they're not without their own issues in terms of selectivity and uh, side effects, uh, but quite a few of those are also moving to the clinic. But my uh, talk today will concentrate on voltage-gated channels and in particular calcium channels. There's been a tremendous amount of work on sodium channels, of course, because these ones identified in the slide here are selectively expressed in the sensory neurons that uh, take the pain, mass pain signals from the periphery into the brain. So there's been a number of preclinical and clinical programs for NAV13, 16, 17, and the TTX resistant 18 and 19 targets. Uh, some of these have got to the clinic, but none of them have progressed past um, phase two. Uh, there's also uh, a number of ligands that are um, activators of the KCNQ, KB7 family, such as retigapine, uh, initially developed as anti-epileptics, but they also show some uh, efficacy in pain models. So there's some fast followers and some reformulations of those substances that are making it towards the clinic as pain targets. But I'll concentrate today on calcium channels. So we've got the PQ type and the N type of high voltage neuronal channels. 
and also the T-type CAS 3.2. They all, ligands for these channels all show good efficacy in preclinical, um, but those that have gone to the clinic have failed to show efficacy and safety beyond phase two. And you might think that that really is a bit of a, a scorched landscape to be doing drug discovery in, but back in 2010, when we started this program with Grunenthal, they looked at this really as an opportunity. The people were getting out of calcium channels, the um, intellectual space, the um, medicinal chemistry landscape was less crowded. There were fewer competitors, and really this was actually an opportunity to develop more effective and more selective calcium channel ligands, especially for CAV 2.2, the N-type channel. So those channels are validated pain targets because of their location and function in the presynaptic nerve terminal. So in the graphic on the left of this slide, let's pretend that that is a dorsal root ganglia, dorsal root nerve terminal that is uh, synapsing onto the uh, dorsal horn of the spinal cord. You see the GPCR receptors that I've been talking about, uh, for example, GABA-B or uh, opioid receptors. They liberate G-protein subunits, which uh, increase the activity of potassium channels or decrease the activity of calcium channels, therefore decreasing the uh, excitability of the nerve terminal and reducing the presynaptic release of neurotransmitter into the spinal cord. So the idea with looking at calcium channel ligands is, is to hack into that pathway, is to cut out the opioid receptor and to directly modulate the calcium channel, which is the end point, the end user for this pain synapse. So there have been a number of approaches for this, and there's been a couple of compounds that have an R in the clinic for modulating calcium channels, and it's a good way to explain the different mechanisms that you can modulate voltage-gated channels, and in particular, calcium channels. So there's an iron channel schematic in the middle graph. Let's start with that big red blob, which is the alpha-2 delta. It's an accessory subunit for calcium channels. It is the target of the gabapentinoids, gabapentin and pregabalin. Um, by modulating that accessory subunit, you can affect the trafficking and the expression and the activity of calcium channels. The only problem is, is it's not selective for a particular type of calcium channel at all. It was thought to be selective for the high voltage channels, but in fact there was a couple of papers last year which showed that um, alpha-2 delta can also modulate T-type low voltage activated channels. So they're very effective, but they're very blunt. They're not selective at all for different subtypes of calcium channels. And you see this as well, that there's a, they're not very efficient in the clinic and a lot of patients withdraw because of the side effects. So another way of modulating ion channels, and this is very common, but not necessarily the best way, is to look at the pore blockers. So you see that black arrow in the middle of the ion channel schematic. So there's an example for CAV 2.2, which is the cone snails aconitide, which is marketed as pre-alt. That is a very selective antagonist for N-type channels because it binds to residues in and around the pore. But the issue there is it's not at all state-dependent or functionally selective. It will block all CAV 2.2 channels in all cells, regardless of whether they're undergoing normal function or whether they are pathophysiologically activated in the injured state. And you see this in the clinic again. The therapeutic index for pre out is very, very narrow and it's only really used as an IV analgesic in end-stage cancer pain patients in hospital. Nevertheless, it shows that you can achieve a selective N-type blocker, and you can then transfer that ligand all the way through to the clinic. But those are not ideal calcium channel modulators. So a lot of uh, companies, including Grunenthal, we went for a third approach, which is a more typical, say, of sodium channels, and that is to look at functionally selective state-dependent blockers. And if you look at the graphic on the right-hand side, this is a, an explanation of why state dependence can be quite useful. So if we look at the normal nerve trace, we're looking at the action potential firing in an uninjured sensory neuron. There's only a low level of action potential firing and there's a negative resting potential. So the channels are just leisurely transitioning between closed and open and inactivated. If on the right in the injured nerve, you'll notice two things. One, the resting potential is significantly depolarized and there is a lot more action potential firing. So in this case, the calcium channels are more actively cycling between closed, open, and inactivated. And if you can develop a compound that preferentially binds and stabilizes the inactivated state, you can remove a lot of those overactive channels from the pool of available channels. 
So you can reduce the pain signaling in a very selective way, leaving the normal function of the nerves and the cells and the calcium channels therein. So we are aiming to develop state-dependent inhibitors. They're traditionally thought to bind to the local anesthetic site, which is shown on the cytoplasmic side of that iron channel schematic with the black and blue arrows. But I should mention there's actually a fourth potential mechanism to modulate calcium channels and sodium channels. And these have been exploited by a number of spider toxins, for example, agrotoxin 4A. They bind to the voltage sensor domains, S1 to S4, and retard the activation or promote the inactivation of calcium channels. Uh, there's also protoxin 2, which binds in a similar way to NAV1.7. And there's been a couple of uh, successful small molecule drug discovery programs that have developed ligands that bind to the voltage sensor domains of uh, NAV1.7 and also KCNQ. I'm not aware of anybody doing this calcium channels, but uh, it is a possibility for the future. So that is the uh, physiological relevance and validation of calcium channels in terms of a drug discovery. Um, looking for state-dependent blockers. So how do we um, organize a screening cascade to discover such molecules? Uh, well, Grunenthal led the chemistry and did all of the design and synthesis of the molecules. So all of their assays and contributions are shown on the right-hand side in the green boxes. Um, Grunenthal also ran a state-dependent plate-based calcium imaging assay on the flipper. So all compounds went through that assay. And though any compounds that had suitable potency and state dependence were then passed to Metrion, and our assays are shown in the purple boxes on the left-hand side. And the patch line and assays that I'm going to talk about today are shown against the asterisks there. So we had a state-dependent primary target potency assay. We have a gene family selectivity panel. And then we also progress compounds through a species, so a rat assay. And once we know compounds are active in the rat, potent and state-dependent, and they also have good ABME and PK, then those compounds proceed into uh, in vivo testing in animal pain models. So as I said, this is a collaboration between Grunenthal and Metrion that started in 2010. We used um, three patch liners during this time to um, prosecute or profile uh, five major lead series. So it was a, a lot of work, but clearly you can see that we used the, the patch liner in anger in an iron channel drug discovery program. And I'll give you some examples of the assay development and screening that we did with the patch liner assays in the following slides. First of all, you've got to start off with good cell lines, so good reagents. Uh, we looked at a number of commercial cell lines for CAV 2.2. In the left-hand graph there, we're looking at what we call patchability. So the number of cells we can capture onto the chip, the uh, level, the quality of the seals. So for us, the minimum cutoff is 500 megohms. So we, we really only like to use GigaSeal quality platforms. Uh, we then also look at the um, number of those seals that are converted to whole cells. And finally, how many of those cells have enough current for a usable assay. So there's a small difference there. Cell line one is slightly better than cell line two. Um, that's just a general patchability profiling. We do that for all the cell lines we, we test at Metrium. For the CAV assay, we developed a screening tree on the patch line, and we then had a, quite a number of robust QC filters through that experimental tree. And we then looked at the different cell lines and then optimized the fa our favored cell line against these QC parameters. So hopefully you can see there along the uh, x-axis, we've got the percentage of cells that don't get captured, those that don't form seals, those that are leaky, those that run down or fall off. And then we end up up towards the right with our overall assay uh, success rate. So this is not uh, a success rate just based on the number of cells that form giga seals. This is a real world success rate, taking a cell all the way through an iron channel screening assay out the other end and making sure that we're happy with all the data that comes from those individual cells. So in this case, we get between 40 and 45% success rate. That is a, low, a little low for us. Ideally, we'd like 50% or more final QC, but uh, calcium channels are very, very difficult to study on an automated patch. Um, so this really was the, the best that we could do over the course of this project. But a little bit more detail on the next slide about how much detail we go into in, in developing and optimizing our assays. And it, this is possible, obviously, because of the, the data-rich environment that you have on the patch liner. We're using professional um, HECA um, P clamp, or patch clamp uh, software and also the patch control from uh, Nanian. So we can extract a lot of data while we actually run cells through these assays. 
Um, one of the parameters that most people would try and optimize for an assay is expression. And the bar graph on the bottom right show it looks like the cell line that we chose is actually pretty much maxed out and the various conditions that we would normally use, they don't have much effect on the expression. And the graph on the left-hand side actually shows you that boosting expression doesn't necessarily boost the overall success rate of an assay either. So test condition number five is shown by the gray stippled bar. And you'll see that in the expression, um, that condition gives us the fewest number of cells that fail to exceed the threshold for expression. But it doesn't necessarily translate into the most successful assay. Those set of conditions actually are really bad for catch cell capture. So overall, that test condition number five is the second worst in terms of overall performance. And test condition four gave us the overall best performance of the assay. So we do a lot of assay validation and assay optimization on the platform that we're going to use for the screening um, before we start using those assays in anger for drug discovery. But of course, that's what's really nice about the patch liner and the flexible, flexible nature of this platform is that it's very easy to optimize assays very quick and it's also very cost effective. So we're designing state dependent assays, then it's all about the biophysics. So we need to determine the biophysics of the CAV 2.2 channels on the patch line under the experimental conditions that we will be using. So first of all, we do the activation curve, the IV curve, to find out where the peak is, and we choose a test potential that's near the peak of the IV. We then are interested in an in inactivated state assay because we want to look for state-dependent blockers. Most people would look at a, a short-term a v, a v, a v, a inactivation curve as shown in the middle panel there. So we're using increasing voltages of a one second duration to inactivate the channels. Um, we, that's not actually a screening assay. Um, quite a lot of our competitors were mixing up resting state and inactivated state assays in the same protocol. We were not big fans of that. We wanted to completely separate those two states out to give very clean information to the chemist so they could use it to optimize the, the compounds. So we elected to have a resting state assay and a separate inactivated state assay. We wanted the inactivated state assay to have about 40% inactivation. So you see from the middle curve there that that's achieved with a holding potential of around minus 60 millivolts. On the right hand side, you can see the schematics for those two different assays and also the current amplitudes. So we get about two and a half nanoamps of current from a, uh, elicited from a negative resting potential, but we get um, 40 or 50% of that when we hold the cells at an inactivated uh, holding potential. So those are the two assays that go together to create the state-dependent assay for CAV 2.2. And this, I think there's a lot of information here, but it's also kind of the sexiest slide out of this presentation. So this is actually showing the full SAR of a lead series determined on the patch line. Um, so on the left-hand side, the bottom graph, we've got all 700 compounds from lead series two. This is all patch liner data. We've got the inactivated state potency on the y-axis and the compound number on the x. So we've now got um, the full SAR, which is very rich for this particular lead series, and the potencies go from low nanomolar to low uh, micromolar. Obviously, most people's eyes are going to be drawn towards the uh, left-hand side of the graph, so I have blown that up in the inset. And you'll see here that we're getting a number of compounds in the 40 to 50 nanomolar range, which is really pretty good for a small molecule modulator of a voltage-gated ion channel. But we've also got a very rich SAR landscape for the chemists. So as I said earlier, we actually looked at a total of five large lead series over the course of eight years, and this is all driven by uh, patch liner data. So we, we certainly got through quite a number of MP16 chips over this period. Uh, the lead compound from this series, which we rather imaginatively call compound A, is probably compound around, around compound number 150. The compounds that were most active were not necessarily the most drug-like, and so Grunenthal are very much aware of that. So the lead compound has a good mix of potency and drug-like properties. And the data from that compound is shown on the right-hand side of this slide. We can look at the top left at the inactivated state assay. We have a, a short period of steady state baseline. And then we've got half log unit increments from 300 nanomolar to 10 micromolar. 
uh, as Andras already showed, we have this um, continuous liquid exchange on the patch liner chip, and you see that there's time and dose dependent decreases on CAV 2.2 amplitude in the inactivated state assay. And at the higher concentrations, we get complete inhibition of the CAV 2.2 currents. On the top right, we can see an individual cell recording. So at higher concentrations of the compound A give a reduction in the amplitude of CAV 2.2, but there's no obvious change in the, act in the kinetics of activation or deactivation. And most significantly, in the bottom part of the graph, you can see the resting state assay. So even up to 10 micromolar, there is no real effect of compound A on the resting state CAV 2.2 channels. It's also really important to note how stable this assay is. For a calcium channel, that is an amazing achievement. I had very little to do with this. Obviously, there's, there's kudos goes to all of the people involved in setting up and running this assay. There's a lot of work that goes on behind being able to show a nice steady state calcium channel recording like that. So if we plot the IC50s that are obtained from the two assays in the bottom right, you'll see there's very little uh, inhibition of the resting state, but there is potent inhibition of the inactivated state. So this comes out about an IC50 of around 400 nanomolar and a state-dependent ratio between 50 and 70-fold, which is absolutely amazing. It is stonking for a small molecule. Obviously, we are very, very impressed. Everyone was very pleased to get this result, and that puts some wind in our sails and let us carry on for a number of years after this to develop a further lead series. But that's compound A, so that's a 400 nanomolar state-dependent blocker of CAV 2.2. That's a great start. Is it selective? This is what we're hoping for, and is it, uh, does it have the desired uh, mechanism of action profile? So the other type of assay and the other type of mechanism that's desired in ion channel inhibitors is, is the use in frequency dependence. As I showed in the injured nerve, you get a high frequency of action potential firing. It would be very nice if your compound could inhibit that type of rapid channel activation and inactivation. It turns out the compound A cannot do that, and quite a number of the lead series that we worked on didn't really show very strong use of frequency dependence against calcium channels. This is in contrast to it being much more common in sodium channels. But we did set up the assay and we did use it on the lead compounds. This is a patch liner recording. So we have a 20 pulse train voltage protocol there. You see there's a small decrease in current amplitude between the, the beginning and the end of the pulse train. In the presence of compound A, there's really only about a 10% increase in that decrement, and there's no further increase when you pulse the cells at 8 hertz as opposed to 1 hertz. So the green bars for various compounds from the lead series 2, they have moderate but variable use dependence measured at 1 hertz. There's an increase in that uh, use dependence when you go to a higher frequency of 8 hertz, shown by the blue bars but only compound B and compound D have a significant use and frequency dependent ratio where the blue bar is larger than the green bar. So we were a little disappointed by this. We were maybe a little concerned if we didn't have UFD, we might not see good in vivo efficacy, but uh, on the later slides, we'll show, we'll sh I'll show you that that actually is not the case. But this is an interesting profile for calcium channel antagonists. They don't appear to have strong UFD. So the next slide is where we've set up the gene family selectivity profiles for uh, this uh, drug discovery project. So we are mostly interested in the neuronal channels. So uh, within the red box on the left, we see the primary target of N-type CAV 2.2. We then have the closely related PQ CAV 2.1 and R-type 2.3. We only set up an assay for PQ, not for R. And there's also the low voltage activated T-type channels, CAV 3.X we set up an assay on the patch liner for CAV 3.2, which is the major species in sensory neurons. T-type channels are also present in the CNS and in the heart and in the retina. So CAV 2.1, the PQ type, we again set up very similar assays on the patch liner. We didn't want to have an identical biophysical assay to CAV 2.2. We wanted to have a similar functional state-dependent assay. So we determined the, the steady state biophysics of CAV 2.1 and 3.2, and, and then we developed a like-for-like -like state dependent assay, not an identical biophysical one. So the resting potential is different for CAV 2.1, and the inactivated state uh, assay is also different. We have a different holding potential for 2.1 than we do for the 2.2, but it does still produce 40% inactivation. On the right-hand side, we can see the act activation and inactivation curves for CAV 3.2, very similar family of uh, 
transient activated inactivating channels that uh, Andres showed in his presentation for 3.2. And with the dotted lines there, we can see 40% inactivation with a holding potential of minus 70 millivolts. So that's what was the inactivated state assay for 3.2. So this is all patch liner data. So the next slide shows you the quite astounding result that we achieved with compound A. Um, it does have amazing selectivity for CAF 2.2. On the right hand side, we've got the actual patch liner data, the IC50 curves, such as they are, for compound A inhibition of T-type channels. Very little uh, inhibition of resting state, a moderate amount of uh, decrease in the inactivated state. Um, and below that, raw current traces showing really no significant effect of compound A on the transient T-type currents. So compound A in the table there is 400 nanomolar against CAV22 and between, let's say, 15 micromolar block of CAV2.1 and CAV3.2. And this is inactivated state versus inactivated state. Some other people look at selectivity by comparing inactivated state of the primary target against the resting state of the others. That's not really fair. In an injured neuron, all of those calcium channels are going to be subject to inactivation and depolarization. So you really have to compare like for like. So for compound A, we see around 40-fold selectivity between the neuronal calcium channels, which is an amazing result. Uh, the major preclinical comparator that we used was from uh, Merck, so TROX1. That's a one micromolar CAV22 blocker with about five to 10-fold selectivity over uh, neuronal calcium channels, which was an outstanding result at the time. So they pretty much finished that work when we began our work. Uh, there's a number of other non-selective or non-N-type blockers from uh, the likes of Neuromed and Zalicus and Abbott. Uh, you can see there in the table. So some of them prefer T-type, some of them are non-selective, but none of them have anything like the selectivity of compound A. So we're, again, a lot more wind in our sails for this, um, being able to see potency and selectivity for um, compound A. The big issue, of course, was is it also active in the rat? Because this is where most of our uh, in vivo pain assays are going to be carried out. So we had a, a similar rat CAF 2.2 cell line. So it was uh, an ortholog of all of the human subunits, so alpha, beta, and alpha 2 delta subunits. Uh, this was made specifically for Grunenthal. When we tested it on the patch liner, we noticed that there was this additional component of slow inactivation in the rat channel that's not seen in the human. So you see this um, difference in the left-hand graph, so this, this additional component of inactivation of positive potentials. And you also see it in the middle graph that if you use a short pre-pulse, it looks pretty normal. But if you use a longer pre-pulse, then you get this additional component. Uh, and this is why we don't like and didn't want to use a mixture of resting state and inactivated state um, bulge protocols in the same screening protocol. It was really important to separate it out because if you do have this sort of slow inactivation, it can look like slow drug block or you can just have your whole assay run down to zero. So the issue here, and we show it on the IT plot on the right, we're looking at current amplitude against time. So this is a 20 to 25 minute experiment on the patch liner. If we hold the cells at minus 90, then we get quite a lot of fast inactivation or rundown and then a slow amount of inactivation and we lose over two thirds of the assay. So we had to use a less, a more negative holding potential, sorry, the, the graph on the top right is minus 80, the one on the bottom is minus 90, which is what we used. So you use a less negative holding potential, so you have less of the slow inactivation. Uh, so that was a bit of a challenge that we had to overcome with the rat cell line. Uh, and next slide, we'll have a comparison here of the um, potency and state dependence in the rat for compound A and the Merck compound. So as you might expect, and many people see, there is a shift in potency. In this case, for both compound A and, and TROX1, there's a roughly threefold shift going between the human and the rat. So 400 nanomolar compound becomes 1.6 micromolar. And for TROX1, it goes from one to four or three and a half. Uh, but Really, uh, most significantly here is there is a, a, an increase in the level of inhibition of the resting state. And so those state dependence is reduced from 40 or 50 fold to 10 or 20 fold. There is still good state dependence in the rat, but I think we think part of this increase in the inactivated state potency is actually this accumulation of slow inactivation, which happens in the rat. This situation with the CAV22 blocker is actually 
pretty good because there's been a, a, a quite a number of notable issues with species shifts seen for other iron channels in the pain space. So big shifts in potency and modality with TRIP-V1. With TRIP-A1, you see antagonists in the human become agonists in the rat. And with NAV1.7, there's been a lot of species shift. And in fact, some cases, compounds are completely inactive in the rat, but very potent in the human. So big issues with other pain targets. It doesn't appear that there's a big species shift for at least uh, compounds from this series. Uh, and we certainly didn't see it for other series against CAV2.2. So that makes this a relatively nice pain target to work on for preclinical translation. And uh, speaking of that, this is my final data slide. Uh, this is some lovely in vivo efficacy work that was done by Chris and others at Grunenthal. Um, the hope here, of course, is that our small molecule will meet or beat the current clinical compounds. And so we show here on the right-hand side, we've got the gabapentin in green, the green triangles, um, not very potent and not that effective in terms of reversing pain. We're looking at the SNL, the spared nerve ligation or Chung model, and our readout here is a von Frey mechanical allodynia, so pushing small fibers against the foot pad of, of mice, of rats, sorry, and seeing uh, at what point they withdraw their pore from this, and if we can um, decrease the sensitivity with these drugs that are generally, in this case, uh, applied um, orally. So the much more potent gabapentinoid pregabalin is in the blue triangles in the middle. Um, it's more potent, and we also get 100%. Sometimes we actually get more than 100% pain reversal. And some people might think that's a good thing, but actually that's a bad thing. Uh, these animals are basically asleep and unable to withdraw their pore, and this is a good correlate of what we see in the clinic, where there's a lot of somnolence and sleepiness and people taking gabapentinoids. And also, very important to mention is the fact that most of the symbols for gabapentin and pregabalin are open rather than closed. And that is the pain, the person carrying out the pain assay has noted side effects, behavioral side effects in those animals. And this is occurring at doses that do not produce significant pain reversal. So this is the example of the off-target effects and why sometimes you need to treat eight patients before any one of them sees any pain relief with gabapentinoids. The leading class of pain relief at the moment obviously are opioids so we've got oxycodone tested in the same assay that's shown by the purple pink squares much more potent uh, than the gabapentinoids and almost complete pain reversal at 30 mg per kg and what's really amazing there and really significant is that lead compound a shown by the purple circles absolutely overlays the opioids so we're having the same potency and the same efficacy as an opioid by directly targeting the downstream calcium channel um, substrate of opioid receptors. And hopefully our small molecule would not have dissociated tolerance and addiction issues as an opioid. And again, I, I can't show the data on this slide, but I can say that the lead series, the CAV2.2 antagonists that we made and tested, they do not show these effects in CAV2.2 knockout mice. So we believe that all of this pain reversal was produced by on-target effects, not off-target. So I'll finish up just with a, a summary. Um, hopefully you've got a, a good gist of uh, how we've used uh, the patch liner in an iron channel drug discovery project and how important it is to really optimize all the steps of that screening cascade. So you start with cell lines, you definitely need to sex up the cell lines, make sure that they're operating at their maximum capacity and efficiency on automated patch clamp platforms, which is quite a challenge. Um, and then it was very nice during this eight year collaboration to be able to integrate our electrophysiology with the medicinal chemistry expertise of Grunenthal. Uh, so we've identified a number of lead series and we filed a number of uh, multiple composition of matter patterns around the chemistry that we've worked on. And in the end, we've identified a formal lead series that completed an 18 month pre IND tox package. And we also have a formal backup series that was identified. And uh, both of these, or all of the, the chemistry that was identified during this uh, is now available for out licensing from Grunenthal. So I'll just finish up very quickly with the most important slide, of course, which is the acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, and obviously most important to um, Kathy Sutton, so she was the project lead throughout the eight year uh, term of this project. And also a big shout out to Rob who did some of the initial assay development. Uh, the people who worked on the lead series two, uh, Jackie, Fred, and Dave, who are not at Metron, they are elsewhere. And as you might imagine, over eight years, quite a number of people have been uh, 
part of this project, so they're all listed there, past and present, veteran employees. Right hand side, we've got a number of the chemists, key chemists and biologists from Grunenthal. So just a big shout out to Stefan and Melanie for the chemistry side and Chris for the in vivo. Uh, and also a number of people helped us set up and run these assays uh, on the patch line at, at uh, Metreon. So uh, big thanks to uh, Michael, Christian and Marcus. So that's me done. And I'll hand back over to Jason for any questions from the audience. Thank you, Mark, for the great presentation. We have some questions that came in throughout Andres's talk as well as yours, so I will now proceed to go through some of the questions. Um, we had a question, can the cells on the hole in the plate be washed off and can the plate be reused or do you have to use a plate for every experiment? Thank you for the question. So. The cells, uh, we do not re recommend to, to wash off the cells and reuse the chips. So it's a bit similar with the glass capillary, what you use in the manual patch clamping. Uh, we recommend to use it once. I mean, there is uh, some studies made where they washed off the, uh, washed the chips, but uh, the success rate was lower. So if you don't want, do not want to risk the success rate, we would recommend to use So I will now proceed with the questions. I think there was a slight technical delay in the lag. Apologies about that. So in terms of the presentation that Andras had gone through, we had a few questions that came through. Can the cells on the hole in the plate be washed off and can the plates be reused? Or does a new plate have to be reused for every new experiment? So thank you for the question. Uh, we do not recommend to reuse the chips because you will risk the, the, the high success rate, but uh, usually we experience with the patch liner. So there were studies which were made, uh, <coughs> which were made to, to, to clean the chips, but the success rate is only guaranteed, current, um, guaranteed if, you, if you use always new chips. Like in case of the manual patch clamping, you also have to change the pipette. Okay, let me go on into the second question now, Andras. How long normally can the cells remain healthy in these conditions? How long can the recording be? So, we would say typically 30 minutes uh, is the is the average of a, a cell can stay viable in case of uh, one recording. Of course, it's not written into stone, but I would say this is this is a, a an average. What is what is what they are mainly what they can use for. So, I would say 30 minutes. And then as a follow-up question, is there sensors detecting when the cell is attached on the hole in the plate? In other words, um, reverse pressure would not be on all the time, right? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, of course, the machine detects that the cell catch is made. So because you will see a, an immediate increase in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the resistance, this, the machine will immediately uh, sensors and then we'll adjust the pressure to go on to form the giga seal. Okay, I will now proceed with some questions that were asked during Mark's presentation. Mark, a user asked, what was the subunit composition of the CAP 2.2 calcium channel cell line? Uh, right, so this was a, a alpha, beta, and alpha two delta um, human sequences, and we used the uh, splice variants that are most common in sensory neurons. So it was an um, alpha one B splice exon thirty seven A splice variant. So we tried to make the cell line as physiological as 
possible compared to uh, human and rodent DRG neurons. And as a follow-up question, uh, did you set up assay for mouse CAF 2.2? Uh, as you said, no effect of lead series compounds in CAP 2.2 uh, knockout mice. Uh, no, we didn't use a cell line. We used um, dorsal root ganglion neurons. So we have some data where we tested the lead compounds, for example, from each series in both rat and mouse dorsal root ganglion neurons using manual patch. We didn't. Uh, we weren't brave enough to try and try that out on the patch liner. Okay, and as a follow-up question, uh, Mark, have you tried running your CAV channels at physiological temp, either automated or manual? What was your final success rate here? No, again, we were not brave enough to, to do that. It is, we are, it is capable of running temperature on the patch liner, but there wasn't a great deal of um, motivation to do that uh, in this project, um, and similarly, we could have done temperature recordings on a manual patch with the cell line or with the um, dorsal root ganglion neurons. But again, this was not a major issue for us. I imagine really that the increased temperature would have just uh, quickened the biophysics, but our expectation was that it wouldn't have changed the pharmacology to a significant degree. And then as a final question, Mark, um, did you test compound A in any other in vivo pain behavior assays or species? Uh, absolutely, yes. So Grunenthal were very keen to have more, rely on more than a single pain assay. So there were different modalities. So we're looking at um, thermal pain, looking at micro, uh, mechanical hyperalgesia as well as allodynia. And we also conduct, well, we, they also conducted uh, tests in both uh, mice and rat uh, animal models. So we, we think we have a pretty good coverage for the uh, preclinical assays in terms of species and modality. And then Andras, uh, just the question for you. Do you have an opportunity to make single channel recordings using your patch liner system? Thank you very much. That's a great question. Yes, uh, you can do single channel recordings. Uh, for example, there is an uh, example where, where uh, erythrocytes were measured uh, on the patch liner in, uh, in cell attached configuration. So, uh, and we were able to measure single channel. Okay, so I will now proceed to uh, do a quick summary. Um, we will make this webinar available on demand um, immediately after completion of the event. We will also transcribe the questions that we've received and you would receive that in a follow-up email. I would like to thank all the viewers for attending today's event and we look forward to a future talk. And as such, if you have any additional follow-up questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us one-to-one. Uh,